Good day, and welcome to the webinar for the 2024 Macy Faculty Scholars Program. I am Peter Goodwin, Chief Operating Officer and Treasurer at the Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation. For those of you who would like to follow via closed caption today's webinar, there is a link we have posted in the chat window that will take you to a live stream that you can view the dialogue. The purpose of today's webinar is to provide you an opportunity to hear from the principals involved with the Macy Faculty Scholars Program. We will share with you the vision, highlights, and information about the program, as well as the application selection process that will be used. Our agenda today is in two parts. The first part is the presentation portion of the webinar, which includes an overview of the program provided by the Macy Foundation President, Dr. Holly Humphrey. We will also be joined by Dr. Sonny Hallowell and Dr. Dimitri Papanagnu, two members of the Macy Faculty Scholars family who will share with you their experiences as scholars. The second part of the meeting and the remainder of our time will be devoted to questions and answers. At the end of the question and answer period, we will spend a final minute on some housekeeping details that you'll need to know in order to submit your online application to the program. Today's webinar is being recorded. You'll be able to view the slides and listen to the presentation and Q&A portion of the webinar on our website within the next week. For any questions you have during today's presentation, please use the Q&A function on your screen. We will answer as many questions as we can at the end of the prepared remarks portion. And now I would like to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Holly Humphrey, president of the Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation. Holly. Thank you, Peter. As many of you already know, um, over the last year or so, the Macy Foundation has been transitioning to a new focus for this program. And um, it's a focus that I will describe further over the course of um, today's webinar. I want to reemphasize, however, that the core vision of our program remains consistent with the vision for which this program was originally established, and that is to recognize, develop, and nurture the careers of promising future leaders in medical and nursing education. And as was true at the program's inception, we seek to make an impact on the lives of promising future leaders by providing them with protected time, with formal mentoring, and with a national network of like-minded colleagues. Our hope is that by providing these resources, the scholars will create educational change at their local institutions, but ultimately um, change that extends far beyond their local institutions. Ultimately and collectively, the scholars have become part of a national cohort of leaders and innovators in medical and nursing education. Now, one very important note that I wish to highlight is that this is a career development award, meaning that we are just as interested in the individual who we are supporting as in the project that they propose to us and to our committee. So we are especially interested in candidates for whom the program will have the maximum impact at this particular point in their individual careers and who have the greatest possibility for future impact in their respective um, professions. Let's go to the next slide. So as you um, see on this particular slide, um, I am emphasizing that we are looking for early career faculty. So as um, our program reached its first decade um, in operation, we invited an external review of um, the program, um, specifically meaning that we had external national leaders in nursing and medical education 
who did a review of the first decade of the program. And what we learned um, from that external review included a set of recommendations that invited uh, the Macy Foundation together with our board of directors to um, consider making some uh, additional changes as we move forward into the second decade. And among those changes are to um, pivot the program to um, an earlier cohort of uh, Macy faculty scholars, which is why um, you see the emphasis on early um, career faculty. Um, we have a particular interest in early career faculty um, so that we can provide the support to really jumpstart and catalyze um, their careers. We also are interested in candidates um, who represent the breadth of diversity in medicine and nursing, um, consistent with the patients and the populations who we serve. That means for us that we will um, continue to nurture and develop our longstanding relationships with um, many institutions across the country, but also um, ideally we are hoping to build new relationships and new partnerships with institutions who have not historically um, submitted uh, nominees for this program and who perhaps have never had a scholar um, from their institution. Next slide. So um, I want to highlight some of the key features of this program. Um, the program provides salary support for 50% of uh, protected time to um, pursue a mentored project at your home institution. And in addition to um, those who are your mentors at your home institution, this program provides formal mentoring from the National Advisory Committee and from program alumni. And the mentoring from the program alumni is a new feature of um, this program that we um, are doing for the very first time actually with the most recent, recently selected uh, cohort, cohort of scholars. We also are um, requiring those who are selected for the program to participate in the Harvard Macy Institute's programs for educators and health professions. Um, if you happen to be someone who's already taken um, that particular course, then we um, will advise you to take one of the many other offerings um, through the Harvard Macy Institute, uh, which now has several um, offerings from which you can choose. Um, the scholars also attend an annual meeting of Macy Faculty Scholars. And of course, um, once a Macy Faculty Scholar, you are part of the Macy uh, family for the rest of your careers. Scholars also um, do have access to a national network of um, not only Macy Faculty Scholars, but Macy uh, grantees and other program offerings um, that the foundation makes uh, from time to time. What I'd like to do um, at this point is uh, give you a chance to hear from um, two individuals who have uh, been a part of the Macy um, family themselves as scholars. I'd like to um, turn this over to Dr. Sunny Hallowell and Dr. Dimitri Papanagnu two um, of our scholar alumni, um, Sunny and Dimitri, will share just a few words about um, their experience as scholars in the program, and that they will be part of this webinar to participate in the question and answer um, session once we finish the formal um, remarks. So Sunny, let me turn it over to you first. Thanks so much, Dr. Humphrey. Um, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. I'm an associate professor and pediatric nurse practitioner at the Emily Louise Fitzpatrick College of Nursing at Villanova University, just outside of Philadelphia. And my time as a scholar has really allowed me an opportunity to really think deeply about the future of nursing. And the reason why this is important is because our patients are becoming more complex and not just because we're really beginning to make great strides in viewing healthcare through a social determinants of health lens, but also because of the events post the COVID-19 pandemic. That really changed a lot of things for all of us and gave us some experiences none of us really expected to have. 
Um, it made me think too about the future of Nursing Report 2030, charting a path to achieve health equity. And in that sense, I was really very fortunate to have an institutional mentor in Dr. Elizabeth Dowdell, who guided my project, but also in a national advisory committee member um, and mentor, Dr. Christine Tanner, who also happens to be the innovator behind um, the next generation NCLEX framework. We're using her framework to sort of educate the next generation of nurses. My project is really very simple. It's designed to help us um, think about how we can use our stories, the stories, our clinical stories every day in a way that we can really learn from them. And I use a method called virtual gaming simulation. Um, it's a free and open access um, opportunity for us to learn. And that's something that the Macy program has been able to allow me to develop. The Harvard Macy Institute programs are absolutely amazing. And I'll tell you a bit about my opportunities with them. The first is that I was allowed to write a blog for the Harvard Macy program, which is a great opportunity to sort of share some of the insights I had learned as a Macy scholar. And I was also um, asked to participate in an interview with the Harvard Macy Institute which um, was really a great opportunity to share even more about my experiences, both in their educational programs and as a Macy scholar. Someday I hope to also volunteer with them to be an instructor with their program. In terms of what I've been able to do for my career, I've been able to present with my fellow Macy scholar, Dr. Jessica DeVito from Duquesne University at a national conference. And probably the most important thing is that I was very successful in achieving tenure at my university. All of these things I'm very grateful to the Macy Foundation for, but probably the most influential thing that we really gain from being part of this vast network are the scholars we get to work with. I can tell you that the scholars that I've worked with in the 2021 cohort really sustained me through these last couple of years as we emerged out of the pandemic. And those relationships and learning from all of the scholars has really been one of the great highlights of my career. And one of the great things that I'm most grateful to the Harvard Macy Foundation for giving me the opportunity to do. And now I'd like to pass it on to Dr. Dimitri. Thank you, Sunny. And thank you so much to the foundation for the opportunity to speak to you about the Faculty Scholars Program. I'm a professor of emergency medicine and associate dean for faculty development at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. And being here today, I'm just reminded of being a participant myself on this very same webinar back in 2019. Little did I know then the impact the program would have on me both personally and professionally. So similar to Sunny, my academic and research interests are in the medical school. Well, it, it similarly in the medical school and, and really focused on uncertainty in clinical practice and specifically how we best prepare learners in the health professions for the transition to the clinical learning environment. Our current models for education and assessment train students very well for certainty. And as we all know, this is rarely the case. It's, it's everywhere in the clinical environment, whether it's making a diagnosis or choosing a treatment strategy or navigating the social and structural determinants of health, or even communicating that uncertainty to patients or peers it's, it's everywhere in the clinical environment. It's a constant. And it's a constant that's connected to the psychological safety of the workplace that we're all in. And the scholars program really allowed me to take a true dive into this work. As I think back as a scholar, I was able to bring this concept of a curriculum for uncertainty in clinical practice to full fruition. Specifically, my project focused on developing and deploying a formal curriculum that prepares students in the health professions for the uncertainties of clinical practice, a vertically aligned curriculum, so spending all four years of training, and housed in one of the courses that I teach, the Health System Science course. Unique to this project, it aligned with several of the Macy priorities, including increasing the collaboration between interprofessional healthcare team members as well as navigating the ethical dilemmas that are associated with making those complex decisions during heightened uncertainty and complexity. 
thinking back to my time as a scholar, the award really gave me the time to think critically about my research questions, to authentically and, and holistically connect with this work and have conversations with thought leaders that are leading work in, around the world, to, to gain support from my institution, and to really be a scholar in the true definition of the word. Um, the best way that I can describe the influence of the foundation on this work is through the analogy of an enzyme. Sure, the project was the ideal substrate and, and very relevant to a need in health professions education, but the foundation just accelerated it, right? It made it possible. It gave me the recognition to have conversations with incredibly innovative individuals across the globe who are doing work already in this space. People in medicine, in nursing, in engineering, in organizational psychology. Um, so many thought leaders influenced my project. And if it wasn't for the foundation, these linkages wouldn't be possible. Um, as a result of this, I'm now part of an international research network that's really looking at how complexity and uncertainty influence the workplace. And it's even given me the platform to mentor other people who are interested in this work. But, but just like Sunny described, taking it back to the foundation and what it affords, mentorship. My personal development and the development of my project were only complemented by the mentorship that was afforded by the National Advisory Committee. The coursework, through the foundation, I too was able to complete two Harvard Macy courses, which were incredible and solely focused on guiding the success of your project. One in particular, the one on assessment, was essential to designing my project's assessment and evaluation plan. And the last thing, the people. I remain inspired by the relationships I'm building with previous scholars, with current scholars. Um, I, I won't be able to find the right word to capture the sense of uh, community that I've gained from the Scholars Program, but all I can say is that the Scholars Program is way more than an enzyme. It's, it's genuinely a family. Thank you for the opportunity to speak about the program. Thank you both, uh, Sunny and Dimitri. Uh, wonderful to have you with us. And um, I enjoyed listening to your retrospective analysis of your experience as um, scholars. Let me now turn to um, three major uh, themes that I'd like to cover before we turn to the question and answer period. So first, I'd like to talk about eligibility criteria for the program, then selection criteria. And then I'll say a few words about the process, um, including some key dates for you to be aware of. So let's start with uh, the eligibility criteria, some of which you see um, on the screen in front of you. The first is that applicants must be a doctorally prepared faculty member at either a school of nursing or a school of medicine. You should be early in your career um, as a benefits eligible faculty member. And I'm, I'm always asked what we mean by early career. We do not have hard and fast rules about early career, but we think of early career as somewhere in the range of three years to eight years on the faculty. But of course, um, those boundaries are fluid um, and, as I said, not absolute, but that gives you a ballpark of um, what we mean by early career faculty. Um, you must be nominated by the dean of your respective school. If you're at an institution um, that has both a medical school and a nursing school, then your institution um, is allowed to nominate both a candidate from the School of Medicine and a candidate from the School of Nursing. If your institution um, has a first year Macy faculty scholar, then you are precluded from nominating a candidate in this next round. You would become eligible again um, the following year, but there's a one-year um, pause if your respective school of medicine or your school of nursing um, has an active scholar in their first year of the program. You need to have identified a faculty mentor um, for the project that you are proposing to us. And your educational project um, should address at least one of the Macy Foundation's three priority areas. I'm happy to speak more about those priority areas during the question and answer, um, if you wish. 
They also are um, presented and discussed on our website if you'd like to learn more about our three major funding priority areas. And then finally, um, you must be a U.S. citizen or permanent resident to be eligible for this program. Now, let's talk about the application itself. The application consists of a statement um, that you write about your career objectives and your personal goals. Um, included with that statement, um, and that's a, it's a very important statement, uh, many, I think, Many applicants, I think, rush to tell us about their project, which, of course, we love to hear. Um, but um, we really want to hear about you. And so don't um, gloss over that first point about telling us how do you um, view your own career? What are your goals for your career? And let that be a segue um, to the project itself. Um, you must have a letter of nomination, as I've already mentioned, from the dean of your school of nursing or uh, the school of medicine. And then um, we need a letter of support from your mentor. And that letter should include um, characteristics that suggest your potential for impact and ultimately for leadership. Um, we need to see a commitment from the mentor on um, their engagement with you as an individual and your professional development, as well as um, for the project itself. Um, the letter should ideally demonstrate the mentor's familiarity um, with you, perhaps from prior work or um, prior experience working with you in some other capacity. And the more that the mentor can be specific about um, how they intend to supervise your work and engage with you as a mentor, um, the stronger the letter and the more meaningful um, it is when our committee reviews it. Um, ideally, the um, mentor should make a case for why they are well positioned to um, sponsor you, your project, and ultimately um, your success. Um, we need a second letter uh, from the chair of your department. And um, the chair's letter is a letter that we are specifically looking to indicate that they are prepared to protect your time uh, to carry out uh, the project because the foundation, of course, is supporting 50% uh, of your time and we need the chair to volunteer that um, they're going to protect your time uh, consistent with that obligation. Um, we also appreciate it when the department chair is able to describe the role that you play in the department um, and the influence um, that you have in the role that you play in the department. And then um, finally, we need a letter from one other senior faculty member um, who speaks about you, um, who speaks about your potential um, as a future leader, as a future scholar. And um, to the extent that that um, additional letter also speaks to your project, that, that's fine, but not a requirement. Um, we need a bio sketch, uh, both of yourself and of your primary mentor. We do not need bio sketches of um, the other letter writers. Okay, so once we have um, your application, then I wanted to say just a word about how our committee um, reviews the application. What are the criteria um, that we use when we're reading through uh, the applications that we receive? And uh, you really see those listed here. Uh, first is, um, what evidence do we have um, that you are viewed in your local institution as an effective um, teacher and possibly um, early leader? Um, we're looking to see whether or not you're in a position to directly influence learners in the local environment. And that often comes across um, through the responsibilities that you have as a teacher, or a mentor, or um, a very active clinician in um, the clinical learning environment. We're looking for evidence of your ability to turn your daily work into scholarship and that you have already had some experience disseminating that work. So often that takes the form of publications, 
um, presentations that you've done at local, regional, and national meetings. So some um, evidence of how you've turned your daily work into scholarly work. Then we look at the merit of your proposed project and try to make um, uh, an educated um, and informed decision about the likelihood that your proposed project will influence national trends in health professions, professions education and ultimately um, you know, has the potential to improve the health of uh, patients um, who are under your care, but uh, the health of the public more broadly. We are looking um, and use the criteria of a strong mentor and of strong institutional support for you personally and for the project um, that you are proposing to us. And then ultimately we're really looking um, to make our best um, guess at your potential to become a national leader in health professions education. So with those criteria in mind, what process do we use? So the first thing is we receive all the applications and senior Macy Foundation staff review each and every application um, to make sure, um, first of all, that it's complete. And then um, we will do the first pass at selecting the semifinalists. Once we have done that, we send uh, the semifinalists to the National Advisory Committee. And that committee um, will select the finalists. So the finalists um, will be interviewed um, by the National Advisory Committee and the senior staff of the Macy Foundation and will ultimately be notified um, who is selected as scholars on February 22nd of 2024 for an appointment that begins on July 1st of 2024. So the specific dates that are important for you to keep in mind are September 15th, when um, we have an application deadline of 11.59 p.m. Eastern time on September 15th. But um, all good applicants know they should apply well in advance of that deadline and not get close um, to midnight on um, September 15th. So I would encourage you to use September 15th as uh, the final uh, deadline, but to obviously apply well in advance of that deadline. On January 31st, you will be notified of your application status. Um, and that um, includes being notified whether or not you're a finalist, but all applicants uh, who have applied will learn by January 31st of their status. As I've already uh, mentioned, the finalist interviews um, will take place on um, February 20, 20th and 21st. The reason that we're giving you um, these dates well in advance is so that you can hold the dates. Um, the February 20th and 21st dates include virtual interviewing, but we wanna make sure that um, if you're selected to be a finalist that you um, do not miss out on the opportunity um, to be interviewed by us. And then on February 22nd, um, the scholars will be notified and the schools will also be notified of their selection. And again, we're giving you um, the dates of our kickoff meeting and annual meeting well in advance so that you can hold those dates in the event that you are selected uh, to be a Macy Faculty Scholar. So um, put these dates on your calendar and, and hold them and um, you will be, if selected, a part of the kickoff meeting and annual meeting where you will meet um, scholars such as Sunny and Dimitri, who you heard from a few moments ago, and a whole host of other um, members of the Macy Faculty Scholar cohorts over time. And then, as already mentioned, the appointment is effective July 1st of 2024. So what I'd like to do now is uh, turn this back over to uh, Peter Goodwin, who will be monitoring uh, the question and answer um, part of this webinar. Peter? Thank you, Holly, and thank you, Sunny and Dimitri, as well. So we've now entered the uh, question and answer portion of this webinar. Um, please, if you have questions, use the Q&A window in your Zoom screen. 
There are a number that have come in already, and I will begin to I will begin to read them uh, to our panelists who can uh, can respond to you. Um, let's start with the first question. Um, it's about the program's preference for targeting the clinical learning environment. The question is, would this include medical and other health professional school environments, those that are pre-licensure specifically, or does it represent more patient-facing environments like clinical rotations or residency training? Wonderful question. And um, I think uh, the answer is specifically focusing on the clinical learning environment, which the preclinical and pre-clerkship um, environments are obviously preparing students for. So in many schools, um, that preclinical or preclerkship um, environment includes elements of clinical experiences that prepare uh, the student. Uh, for their arrival in the clinical environment. And if you are able to make a strong enough case for that preparation and how that's relevant to ultimately the clinical experience, then that will be an acceptable um, project. But we at the Macy Foundation are very intentional about focusing on the clinical learning environment because it's complex. It's where a lot of the uh, most important challenges for um, providing patient care uh, really take place. And so that is why we have a focus on the clinical learning environment, but I don't wish to negate um, what happens in preparation um, for arriving in the clinical uh, learning environment. And if you have a project that um, can convince us of that uh, preparation being relevant to the clinical envi environment, then I would encourage you to um, put that in front of us. Thank you, Holly. Uh, this next question is about a faculty mentor. In fact, we've got several questions from attendees inquiring about whether or not the faculty member, how important is it that they come from the scholar applicant's institution or um, could they come from another institution, maybe where the scholar has formerly been at or they have some other affiliation or arrangement with? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, I'm going to invite um, our panelists to join in um, on an answer to that question. And let me just begin by saying that we have seen successful applicants from both kinds of mentoring relationships, meaning both local mentors within their institution, as well as subject matter mentors or mentors with expertise not present at their institution who come from another institution. So we have members of uh, the Macy Faculty Scholar family who have had um, successful projects with a layered mentoring arrangement such that there was a local mentor and in addition, um, an external mentor who had that kind of subject expertise. I would caution you, however, to not have um, anyone at your local institution as a mentor because you are at risk for signaling um, something about the lack of institutional support um, for you and or for your project. So if you were going to have a mentor outside of your institution, I would encourage you to think of the layered approach where you would have um, one mentor locally as well as um, someone externally. Dimitri, um, do you have a point of view about that? Um, yeah. I agree. I like the concept of layered mentorship, and that's exactly what I did uh, during my time as a scholar. I had an institutional mentor from the medical college, um, another individual that was peripherally involved in the college of nursing, but the conceptual framework that informed my study was a faculty member from Teachers College, Columbia University, and she too was part of that mentoring network. So um, it's so long as it's intentional and and there's open lines of communication and it's layered um, and it adds relevance to the project, I think um, the potential applicants can be very creative in terms of how they sort of think about crafting their, their mentorship model to support their project. 
Great. Thank you, Dimitri. Sunny, um, is there anything you'd like to say related to the mentoring? Yes, I also had a layered mentoring relationship. My institutional mentor was really instrumental in sort of um, inviting other uh, institutional faculty um, to learn more about my project. But I had another mentor at Centennial College in Toronto, Canada, who was um, my sort of device expert. And um, Dr. Margaret Verkwell was really instrumental in helping me learn about how to construct the simulation I created. Great, thank you both. Yes, thank you all. Let's um, let's stay on this um, topic of mentoring. Um, there's a question here um, from an attendee who would like to know what good characteristics of a, does a mentor have, or what should one look for in a mentor? What qualities do you all feel are helpful? Yeah, that is a very important question. And again, I'm going to ask uh, Dimitri and Sunny to uh, weigh in on this. Um, I think the single most important thing um, for you to be looking for in your mentor is um, accessibility and engagement um, with you and your project. Now, that may not mean that they have the expertise in the particular area uh, in which you're working, but if they have authentic engagement and um, interest in you and your career development, then the very best mentors will also act as a sponsor and uh, connect you to other experts and introduce you to their network. Um, so I think that their accessibility and engagement with you is the single most important thing. And then if that's the kind of mentor that you um, have identified and who will be writing a letter um, as a mentor, they need to be prepared to explain how they're going to mentor you. Um, what kind of frequency are they going to meet with you? How are they going to introduce you to other experts uh, locally and nationally? Um, what roles does, do they see themselves playing? Um, Sunny, would you like to comment on uh, the qualities that you looked for in your mentors? So I was really fortunate that my institutional mentor was someone that would help me um, build a community within my own institution. So starting there. And then as the project progressed, was able to introduce me to people that were that were beyond my institution um, at conferences, but also at other meetings of nursing schools. And I found that very influential and also very supportive in supporting my work on social media, which I thought was um, in this day and age, something that was really important. Um, Dimitri? Yeah, so a very similar response. My institutional mentor was a senior associate dean at the medical college, and she was instrumental in being able to find ways to implement the curriculum and really needed to believe in it and buy into it and help me sell it to the curriculum committee. And my external mentor, Victoria Marsick at Columbia University, was a content expert, but was very engaged and just as excited for the program as I was. And even today loops me into this incredible network. So I think that piece, Holly, of engagement, um, in addition to that content expertise is essential. So, you know, just summarize, I feel like you need somebody locally at the institution that will support you to implement it, to make it possible. Um, and then, you know, matching that with, with content expertise and engagement. Thank you all. This next question is about um, the dissemination of the scholar's work. Um, the, the question is how the foundation um, helps the scholars disseminate their work more broadly. Oh, I love that question. Thank you. Um, thank you for posing that because that is uh, a topic that the foundation has been actively exploring because we, we're excited about the possibility of doing more um, to help with that dissemination. Some of the things that we already do um, are featuring our, our scholars in um, blogs. Uh, this year, we're going to feature our newest cohort of scholars on our podcast series. Um, we regularly feature the projects uh, that our scholars work on and complete, not only at our national meeting, but through our newsletter 
and through social media challenges, uh, social media channels. However, as I said, um, we uh, at the foundation are actively looking for ways that we can um, increase the uh, presence both in traditional media and uh, social media for your work. So there are many opportunities um, for that to happen. And we're, we are really looking forward to exploiting those opportunities because the more that um, your work is disseminated, the more that those three funding priorities that uh, we have at the foundation are able to really be executed. Thank you. This next question is about the, the proposal itself that is submitted as part of the application. Um, and the question is, um, should the proposal blend um, the academic together with one's own passion for their work and subject matter? How important is that? Well, I personally think that's extremely important, although I can tell you um, when I was a very junior faculty member trying to identify the projects to work on. Um, I'm not sure I would have characterized as where my passion was because I wasn't quite sure exactly where my passion was, but that became clearer with time. But the projects um, that I came up with were very relevant to the work I was doing every day in terms of caring for patients, teaching students and residents, um, and so forth. But um, I think it's in many ways um, a wise question and one that in some ways I wish I had asked myself uh, more rigorously early in my career. But I do know that Dimitri and Sonny have um, thought a lot about that question. So Dimitri, I'd love to hear your point of view. Uh, thank you, Holly. And I think that's a great question, a, a tough question. But, you know, for me, the work around uncertainty was really inspired by individuals that were doing this work in, in various different spaces. And it was an opportunity to really bring those conversations on preparing our learners in a space that really um, hasn't had much attention. It was an opportunity to, to really advance into professional education. It happened to be an area that I was very really personally invested in. I think coming down to the proposal and writing the proposal, the one challenge that, that comes with writing a proposal is sort of that elevator pitch. Um, there's so much passion and interest and work and excitement in there and getting that message across very succinctly is, is really challenging in what you want to do. Um, I think the take home from, from going through that experience was finding a way to clearly, succinctly articulate the project, what you want to do, um, that anybody who picks up the proposal that's not steeped in that work can really understand well. And, you know, doing that uh, required some practice and some time, but um, ultimately the proposal came from a place of passion. It came from a place I was informed by a gap in health professions education. Um, and then crafting the proposal itself took some practice to sort of convey that elevator pitch to convey that need to the foundation. Great. Thank you, Dimitri. Um, Sunny, would you like to comment on that? I'd love to. Thanks so much, Holly. So I think my project was born out of a direct response to a, to something that I had experienced in our clinical setting, which was the real difficulty that clinical faculty probably everywhere experienced in terms of finding really high quality clinical experiences that were consistent for all of their students. And so simulation became an answer that I could explore. And I think that um, being able to be passionate about what you're learning, but then also be able to apply it to the things that you're doing really makes for a strong project because then it's immediately applicable to the setting where you're in. So I found that to be really helpful. Yeah, thank you both. Um, so I think in summary, I would just say that the more that you can identify a project that appeals to your own interests, but has practical value for your institution, the more that there will be alignment and energy and excitement um, from the leaders of your institution to really support you in getting the work done. And I, I have always found that um, particularly helpful because you get a lot of allies and um, energy 
to because they're equally invested in in your project. So um, I would just keep in mind the what's practical. What can you do in a two year time frame? Who will be your allies to support you um, to get that work done? Um, and hopefully it intersects closely with, with things that you care a lot about. But you know, in a two-year project, you won't be able to change the world, but you may be able to change some aspect that changes the world for a patient or for the residents in your program or for the nursing students, and that can make a world of difference. Thank you all. This next question uh, brings us back to the mentor issue again, um, and that has to do with the mentor's rank. Um, how important is it that the mentor have a rank higher than the applicant, or could it be someone who's at the same rank, i.e. an associate professor mentoring an associate professor um, as part of the application? Thoughts on that? Yeah. Yes, um, great question. Um, we strongly believe in um, peer mentoring, near peer mentoring, um, reverse mentoring. So it is okay to have a mentor at um, your same academic rank. If you choose that, um, it will be important for our committee to understand um, why you're making that choice. And it may be that that individual has a sphere of influence um, that will help you get your project accomplished, such as perhaps um, that person is the chief nursing officer or the chief medical officer or the associate dean for quality and safety, or they they have a role within, within the institution that has a sphere of influence that's going to help you get that project done. And that's the most important thing, but both you and the mentor will need to tell us that. Um, and the more that you can tell us that right up front and not leave us guessing, um, the more favorably um, the project is reviewed. So um, absolutely, it's fine to have um, a mentor of, of the same rank, but tell us why and how that's going to benefit the project and you. Along these same lines, Holly, a, a question here is whether or not the department chair of the applicant could serve as a mentor. Yes, the department chair can definitely serve as a mentor. Um, if the department chair is the mentor, however, I would caution you that um, our committee will be somewhat skeptical about whether or not the department chair really has time to be your mentor because they have so many other um, roles and responsibilities to fulfill. So if the department chair is um, presented as the mentor, that individual's letter should um, be very specific about how they're going to carry out that mentoring role. And that might include things such as how frequently are they going to meet with you? How are they going to delegate specific aspects of um, the mentoring responsibility to certain um, experts within your department or within your institution. Um, and the more specificity that they can provide, the more confidence we will have that they can really pull this off. In other words, be both the department chair and your individual mentor. It's certainly um, possible because it's not uncommon for a department chair to have previously been in a role that aligns very tightly with you personally or with your project. Um, and now they just happen to be the department chair. So we don't want that to count against you, so to speak, because they may be the ideal mentor for you, but you need to tell us why that's the case. And the mentor needs to be um, in a position to explain how they're going to actually get it done. Because as I said, we're going to be skeptical of their time demands. Thank you, Holly. Uh, this next question, um returns us to the proposal itself that the applicant would submit. And it's um, it's getting at the foundation's strategic priorities. As you know, one of the foundation's strategic priorities is diversity, equity, and belonging. And um, the question is sort of how might that manifest itself in the proposal? Um, for example, the question is, could the patient population served um, in the in the project by educational intervention be a factor in in achieving diversity, equity, and belonging, and helping to meet the 
criteria that we want folks to focus on one of the foundation's three priorities in their proposal? Yes, wonderful question. And actually, that's the kind of question that we get asked very frequently. So our general overview related to that priority area is that everyone who works, learns, or receives care in our clinical learning environments should feel that they belong there. And there are many um, different projects that align themselves with that priority area. Now, the caution I would have given um, the description of what you are interested in, and that is um, the care that's actually provided to a diverse patient population, that's a very big undertaking. That is the undertaking of a lifetime's work. Um, and so your challenge will be to take that big picture goal which I hope you'll always have and, and um, stick with, and take a very small piece that lends itself to a two-year project that involves some interaction between learners and their teachers that can help positively impact the patient population. So I hope that's helpful um, in thinking about the big picture of the patient care that's provided, but a project that might lend itself to a two-year time frame that involves um, teachers and learners in some aspect of diversity, equity, and belonging in that environment that your project um, could influence and impact. Thank you, Holly. Um, this next question um, is about eligibility, and the question is, is an applicant who holds another career development award, like a K01 award, are they eligible to apply to the Macy Faculty Scholars Program? Great question, and let me say that um, we stand behind our criteria of um, our, our sponsorship of providing 50% of um, your salary support. Um, and so the question you're raising in many ways comes back to your institution and um, how are they going to balance our um, support for your project um, up to 50% of your salary together with other support that you may have for other projects um, and how will your department and institution manage both your outside grant support and your internal responsibilities uh, for patient care and teaching? And in our experience, um, very often that gets settled at the local level. So we are not going to automatically um, exclude you um, because you have other grant support, but I would say it would be worth your time to check with your institution um, and also with the other granting agencies um, what their expectations are related to uh, total support. Thank you, Holly. Um, we are approaching near the top of the hour. Um, there are many um, questions that are coming in and we only have time to take one last question. Um, that question is, um, whether or not the proposal can target more downstream continuing education, which would presumably address more systemic issues in healthcare, or should it focus on um, student or resident education in the clinical learning environment? Thoughts on that? Yeah, that is actually a question that um, we wrestle with um, at the foundation because they're are some very compelling um, programs and projects in continuing medical education uh, that are clearly worthy of funding. However, our priority is um, for the next generation of physicians, and that generally means students, um, graduate students, and residents. However, sometimes there are projects in continuing medical education that. Um, can target the faculty teachers, but simultaneously 
the graduate students, the residents, and or the undergraduate uh, students in nursing or medicine. And so if you have a project that is uh, primarily focused more on faculty, faculty development, I would encourage you to make a connection back um, to the learners. And if your project lends itself to that, then I would say it's going to be a good fit. If it's exclusively to meet continuing medical education expectations um, for faculty without touching the next generation, that will likely not raise um, to the level of funding. I don't wanna say that in a hard and fast way because there are some innovative um, ways, especially using technology where, of course, the more the faculty is developed, the more their learners benefit. But um, I would just be careful in that domain for the reason um, that I said. Thank you, Holly, and thank you, Sunny and Dimitri. So now I'd like to turn to some housekeeping issues uh, before we conclude today's webinar. We are utilizing an online application for the Macy Faculty Scholars Program. To access the online application, you must first go to our website and click on the Macy Faculty Scholars button in the navigation bar and go to the apply page. For your convenience, the URL is displayed on this slide. From there, you can click on the Apply Now button and you'll be directed to the online application platform. To apply, you'll need to register for an account on our platform. You'll also need to get the tax identification number for your school as part of the registration process. Once you've registered and logged in, you may save and return to your application as often as you like prior to submitting it. If you have questions during the application process, you may email us at info at macyfoundation.org. But before you email us, we encourage you to view the frequently asked questions that are posted on our website, and once again, on the URL on the slide that you're viewing now. We'll continue to update the frequently asked questions of our website throughout the open application period up until September the 15th. Also, the program brochure, which is another very helpful and detailed resource, is available on our website. And I would encourage you to return to that frequently as you prepare your submission. And finally, as a reminder, by next week, we will have a recording of this session post on our website. That recording will be both the audio portion and the slides, as well as the closed captioned stream we engaged in today. They'll all be available next week. Thank you, and I'll turn it back to Holly for concluding remarks. Thank you, Peter. And I wanna thank um, all of you who participated um, in today's webinar, and also um, all of you who may um, be viewing this webinar at some future date. I hope um, that our paths will cross either through this application process or at some point uh, down the road. And most of all, I want to thank um, our, our guest panelists today, Dr. Sunny Hollowell and Dr. Dimitri Papanagnu. I hope that you too will have a chance to um, meet them in person. If you don't, already know them. Um, they are terrific colleagues, and obviously the Macy Foundation is extremely proud of them, as we are of all of our scholars. Um, so thank you all for listening and participating, and a big thanks to the Macy Foundation staff um, who helped prepare and will help disseminate um, this webinar. Thank you.